Thank you. <clears throat> One of the things I like to do is first give a very brief introduction about myself. When I got started, um, I'm an old Bitcoiner. I started in 2011. In those days, you could buy a Bitcoin for about uh, $5 Canadian, maybe $4 US. In the fall of 2011, I was living in Prince George. I started buying Bitcoin. I did some mining. And of course, that gets quite cold. And you, once you're buying Bitcoin, you move around all this cold weather. And then when I go get home, I would my hands were freezing. It was minus 20 or minus 25 C. So I would go and stick my hands behind the miners to warm myself up. And that's when I came with the idea of Arctic Mine. Um, got involved with, uh, did a lot of research in Bitcoin, as primarily an issue as an investor. And one of the things that bothered me about Bitcoin is it's all great technology and everything, but can people actually use it at scale? And the answer soon became clear to me that you couldn't. You only can do three, six transactions a second. This is great technology, great ideas, but is it going to be a world changer? Well, not if you can't compete on a volume. And I spent a lot of time researching this. And by complete accident, when I was researching scaling on Bitcoin, I came across Monero in 2014. And lo and behold, I researched and I said, Monero has a solution to this. It actually has an adaptive block size. And you can actually scale this thing, and people can actually use it. And that really got me excited about it. And what a part of the history of it is I got involved with Monero for reasons that have nothing to do with privacy. It's kind of like you're getting off the Titanic, it's sinking, and the rescue ship only has private cameras. Great. But that was kind of the way I felt about it. So uh, I started Monero in 2014. I joined the Monero core team in 2016, when at the time it was far more relevant than it is today. And what I primarily have focused on in my work in Monero has been scaling. Uh, how does it scale? How do we actually go for large scale scaling on level one? How many can we increase the transactions for per second? And this is kind of the focus. And the response to some of the threats, which were mentioned, uh, particularly the political threats, also have a scaling solution, and they, and, they, and they interact. The question of blockchain surveillance is something that's really troubled me, because in reality, it is an illusion. It's the illusion of blockchain surveillance. Does it really work on Bitcoin? Is Bitcoin a surveillance coin? I love that question. And the answer is, I don't believe it is. Bitcoin is actually a privacy coin. There is privacy in Bitcoin. Um, more than people give it credit for. And that might be a shocking comment because, oh, wait a minute, you can, you can trace transactions on Bitcoin blockchain. I would argue you can't in any reliable way. But let's go back to basics. So I thought, I'm going to start with the question of, why is privacy a crime? I'm not going to talk about my t-shirt, but why is privacy a crime? And why are governments so afraid of it? And this is an important question. So let's take a look at the Bitcoin white paper. It actually has a section on privacy. Now, this is a document that came out in 2008. It addressed the question of privacy in a very simple area. But it talks about the traditional banking model. It achieves a level of privacy by limiting access to information the parties involved in the trusted third party. Now, in the trusted third party, when we're dealing with a regulated bank, we're talking about the regulators that regulate that bank or that regulate that financial institution. They, in, in general, should be seen as a trusted third party. They're, because they're trusted and they're heavily regulated, they can have access to the financial information. 
the, 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 by restricting the information to trusted parties, you have a level of privacy. And in fact, it can be quite decent privacy. Now you say, we're going to put it on a public blockchain. We're going to announce all the transactions publicly. And then we ask the question, of, well, how do we have privacy on a public blockchain? And the argument, which is really interesting, says, but privacy can still be maintained by breaking the flow of information in another place. And here's the key. Keeping public keys anonymous. The key to privacy in Bitcoin is keeping the public key anonymous. This is right in the Bitcoin white paper. What we do, whether it's an add-on, which the governments have been, or both in, in America, United States, and here in the European Union, have been tr going desperately trying to stop, is they don't want the public keys to be anonymous. Yeah, there we go. They don't want these public keys to be anonymous. They want the illusion that they can surveil the public keys and somehow discern information about the people that control those keys. Public can see someone sending an amount to somebody else. This is true about Bitcoin. But without information linking the transaction to anybody. Now, if I create a Bitcoin address, and let's say I buy Bitcoin anonymously, and I, nobody can know, and I put it in a Bitcoin address. Uh, does anybody know I own that Bitcoin address? The answer is no, it is anonymous. And this is by design. So then it goes into the, this is the level of information released on stock exchanges, time and size, and then use the tape is made public, but without telling who the parties are. So you see that the, the cumulative traits but not the individual traits. So it talks about a traditional privacy model, identities, transactions, trusted third party. This is where the government can do KYC and do all this other anti-money laundering and counter-terrorist financing, etc. Counterparty, and then you have a, a barrier of the public. In the new privacy model, you don't have the trusted third party. You have identities, transactions, public. So if you're going to turn and turn around and introduce a trusted a third party, he'll go back to the traditional privacy model. But the myth is, this is actually an anonymous key. The myth of proxy surveillance, the illusion is that you can surveil this reliably. And the evidence is less and less than you can, and it's actually very dangerous. So now let's fast forward to 2023. This is from Markets and Crypto Assets in the European Union. And it's a very interesting regulation. It's the operation of a triad of financial crypto assets from the official journal of the European Union. And it refers to an inbuilt anonymization function. And this is straight from the legislation. The operating rules of the trading platform for crypto assets shall prevent the admission to trading of crypto assets that have an inbuilt anonymization function unless the holders of those crypto assets and their transaction history can be identified by the crypto, service, crypto asset service providers operating a trading platform for crypto assets. The requirement of this particular regulation is if I go back to the previous slide, somehow we can't have these public keys anonymous. And why is that? Because instead of doing should I press the right button, trust a third party and doing your KYC here, we somehow want to just break the privacy model here. Now do they have, have we, anybody seen any evidence how this is done? No, but that's the basic essence. So the minute you try to do this, okay, here we go. 
Okay, the minute you try to do this, you have to build this becomes a threat. So you have to prohibit it somehow. You have to say, okay, we have a solution that we can surveil it. So any kind of privacy becomes a threat to your, your compliance model. Anti-money laundering, counterterrorism financing, sanctions evasion, whatever it is. If you're going to solve a crime, you've got to put all the information public. You can't just do KYC in private, provide it to the exchange or the, or the obliged entity. No. What we have to say is we're going to make all the information public and then let a company surveil the blockchain and maybe discern who actually made the transaction. And that's the essence of the illusion. Okay. So now we look at what's happened in the latest. So a couple of criminal convictions. Bitcoin fraud case, Ronan is telling on. Um, individuals accused of running Bitcoin fog. And they provided some traces and argued that he issued certain Bitcoin transactions. But again, there's a lot of questions in this case. This is uh, something that uh, we heard from the attorneys involved. It will be appealed. Um, and there's going to be a substantial order of appeal. But it was based on this idea that you can surveil the blockchain. Did they get the wrong guy? Yeah, I believe they did. But the illusion of blockchain surveillance put this fellow in jail. Now we'll go to the Netherlands. It's a bit different case there. But there the argument is that there's no justification for privacy on a blockchain. So we're going to do financial transactions, and it's not justified, and you have, if you're going to work in a P2P a blockchain, you have to broadcast all your personal information so it can then be surveilled, from which a company can then provide some indication as to whether or not there's risk of money laundering. Isn't it just simpler for the person who is dealing with a crypto asset service provider to do old-fashioned KYC and provide that information in private to the crypto asset provider, which is called KYC, as opposed to say, we're going to do the surveillance scheme? Again, there's a lot of reasons why we need privacy in financial transactions. And again, this is another case likely to be appealed. In fact, it's been appealed already. There's another element in the United States of tornado cash, similar issue again. The fear of the privacy, the fear that we're going we're gonna to surveil the blockchain. And then we're going to turn around and say, we're going to make privacy a crime. Because if you don't make privacy a crime, you can't surveil the blockchain. To maintain the illusion, privacy has to be a crime. Similar well, the United States, similar story. The bottom line here is the difference between the illusion and the reality of blockchain surveillance will be tested in the courts for years to come. And mark my words on this, I would not be surprised if the matter comes up before the European Court of Human Rights because of serious interferences with the European Convention of Human Rights um, associated with this illusion. In the United States, you're talking the First and Fourth Amendments for starters, but again, there's serious constitutional problems. In other countries, again, like in Canada, the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, you go on and on and on. You could even argue in the case of the UK, you can go all the way to the Magna Carta. Um, this is a serious problem. And this illusion lies at the heart of these attacks on privacy that we've seen and that a lot of us are, are, are talking about here. So it really puts us some great, some interesting challenges. So why the conflict? Well, again, traditional banking model has dealt with bare assets. Now, a bare asset is cash, is things like gold and uh, precious metals, even bearer bonds, etc. cetera, for, for, for years, for decades. And, and if managed to address and mitigate the risks of associated with money laundering, terrorism financing, and sanctions evasion. One common method is know your customer. Now, I know people, a lot of people don't like know your customer, but it has a place particularly for large accounts. Uh, in this model, financial information is provided to the regulated obliged entity in private. The release of this information is subject to government regulations. In the European Union, we have something known as 
We have privacy regulations. We can't divulge the uh, private inf information. This financial issue can then be used to develop regulations to, to address risk. There is no need to publicly broadcast the customer's financial information to, in order to avoid it. So this avoids the conflict. There's no conflict between privacy and, and compliance. You just have to look at the traditional financial system. So, now we move to the model of blockchain surveillance. In blockchain surveillance model attempts to deal with bearer assets such as Bitcoin, Monero, etc., while attempting to address and mitigate the risk associated with money laundering, terrorism financing, and sanctions evasion. The primary method is the surveillance of a public blockchain. In this model, the private information is broadcast by the user or by somebody on behalf of the user, and then the customer, and then any attempt at privacy seems high risk or as worse as criminal. The reliability of this model and the risk of false accusations is largely unknown and or proprietary. Has anybody seen accuracy information on any of the, of the so-called analytics works that has been done for anti-money laundering on Bitcoin or on Ethereum? Is there any publicly, independently verifiable information on how accurate this stuff is? Did they get the right guy? And the answer is no, because it's all unknown and proprietary. So the need to bro publicly broadcast, even for there to be a chance that this thing can work, is where that source of the conflict lies. And it's a, when you think about the problem of objective, we sort of dis distance ourselves, we have to realize the, the situation we got ourselves into. And why there's a conflict. So for Monero, there are two challenges primarily. The first group uh, is what I call uh, advocacy responses, legal responses, etc., and, and protection responses. I have a lot of great talks on this subject. There's lots of different ways to deal with it. And quite realistically, it doesn't matter. Individual members of a decentralized community are going to have totally different points of view of how you go about dealing with this problem. The more decentralized, the better. What works for me isn't going to work for you. It's that simple. The technical silence is a different story. It requires the hardening of Monero's privacy to the degree that even the illusion of blockchain surveillance is removed from Monero. And the key point is the illusion. We can't have EAB attacks, or E, sorry, E, EAE attacks or EABE attacks. Even if they don't work, the possibility that it might work has to be eliminated. And that requires two things. Yes, the work of full chain membership groups, absolutely vital. Unfortunately, it's coming along very fast and very efficiently. The second one is we have to increase the use of Monero and scale it. It's called privacy in numbers. I used to say it was enough to at least become as big in transactions as Ethereum. That's too little. We should be aiming for Visa transaction numbers. Let's drown the Bitcoin surveillance companies in Monero. Right now, maybe they can drown in Ether. It's big enough that they can start to drown in it. Let's drown them in Monero. So many transactions, they won't have a hope. So it's about the illusion. Okay, so I'll come to the next slide. So now we get into the technical elements. What are we going to do on the scaling side? And this is a this is where this this talk shifts more into let's roll up our sleeves, let's figure out how do we make Monero scale, and what we have to do, and what some of the technical definitions are. Okay, so this is a part of definition, it's a bit boring. The first area here is what we call reference transaction size. By that I mean it's bigger, somewhat bigger, say about 20% bigger 
than a typical transaction. And kind of the figures of uh, full chain membership proofs have been discussed, puts it in this kind of range of about 4,000 bytes, maybe a bit smaller than that, in the high threes. So a 4,000 byte will barely make it, just about make it, and at 8,000 bytes we're really comfortable. The difference is we need a higher fee. MB, this is the TR, MB is the block size and byte, the each block. These are block periods. The one of interest here is Monero, but it's kind of interesting to compare with some of the other coins. We're a two minute coin. Bitcoin is a 12, a 10. Bitcoin Cash is a 10. Ccash is 75. Think of Bitcoin with eight times the transactions. They were spammed and they were spammed attack badly. So this is just something to keep in mind. Um, you know, how you control these things. Litecoin is 150. On estimated transactions per second, you just divide that, you multiply the block period by the block size, and you divide by the transaction rate, and you get your TPS, your transactions per second. And by the way, Vista is about 6,700 transactions per second average. So now we look at some other factors here, our basis, the block reward. This, by the way, is a very important parameter. In Monero, unlike Bitcoin, and unlike most coins, we have a tail emission of fixed block reward of 0.6 Monero. This is a critical parameter in understanding the security of Monero and in fighting any kind of spam attacks or uh, what's called 51% attacks. So fees, this is the penalty, very simple. You take uh, the percentage increase in the block size and you multiply it by a base, you square. So the penalty, is when I want to increase the block size in Monero, so the data block size, let's say I'm at 400,000 bytes, and I want to increase it by 10%, that's 40,000 bytes, I'm going to have to pay, the miner has to pay a penalty of, well, it's the ratio of 440,000 to 400,000, that's 0.1. Uh, 10% and then we square it as 0.01. So 0.01 of my block reward is forfeited to this penalty, effectively burned, because we have a fixed amount. In order for the miner to pay for this, <coughs> the money has to come from somewhere and it has to be compensated by fees. So this is the key element of fee markets in Monero. You want to increase uh, the block size, you pay a penalty and you lose a portion of your block reward. So you want to get it from somewhere else. So this is the idea. This is the maximum block time uh, M MB max at time of mining. That's the set in the protocol at uh, twice the median, MN, which is also called an MS. Uh, and so what that says is you can only double the block in the, in the short term medium. And I'll explain this later on. But the, the basic idea is that you can only go to twice as much. So now we have some of the changes we're proposing. The first change is to increase what we call set M, um, uh, so minimum penalty free zone. It's currently 300,000 bytes, and it's be increasing it to 400,000. One of the ideas here is, from what we're looking at, we're going to go from about uh, 2,000 bytes to the high threes. We're going to go somewhere like about 38, 39,000 uh, bytes for um, transaction sizes with full chain membership proofs. So we increase this to compensate and it'd be approximately 1%. The new idea is to introduce an extra median, a very long median of a million blocks. That's roughly two years in the Bitcoin blockchain. And that tracks roughly what's called as Nielsen's law. And what Nielsen's law is, is the increase in bandwidth as we increase uh, with time. And that's basically been 50% a year going back to the 1980s. Um, we're going from essentially a hybrid, well, basically it's a hybrid copper fiber network. And as we move the fiber closer and closer and closer to the home <coughs> and then to the room, you increase the bandwidth. So the, the idea is that it'll roughly track Nielsen's law 
and you do a median calculation. So you calculate uh, your, your block size, the minimum of that, and twice the, um, the amount of, you only have you know, double. Uh, then it's gonna be the maximum of that, it's gonna be greater than set M, set M and MA over two. And you do a recursive calculation. I got an excellent question just before I talk about this. When you're doing the recursive calculation, you start with MN, but in order, sorry, MA, but when you want to jumpstart the set right at the very beginning, the very first one, you don't have a medium MA, you've got to start with, M, with set M. So in your first recursive calculation, the number you put in is set M, and then after that, as you work through the chain, every other cases is the previous 1001 block. So, we're now going into, next slide, there we go. So this is what we call the long term median that's currently ex in, in existence. The main change here is against a medium of um, 100,000 blocks. Again, we start at ML, we do the recursive calculation. Now the difference is now we're gonna cap it in protocol to this MA. So, if, if, uh, so you can only go this amount. <clears throat> so if you got a really sharp increase in ML, once you get to this level, until MA moves, you can't increase it any further. So this is where the cap occurs, but it's also gonna be the option of using node relay to price it at earlier stages. And the idea here is to create a flexibility so the community can respond to events without having to go to protocol, we say, okay, well, let's put a fee because maybe we're worried that we're growing too fast or maybe we're a spam attack. And this is an option that can be done at, at Node Relay. And you don't necessarily have to go to these numbers, but you can do it. Now you've got a tool to use it and you don't have to change the protocol in order to actually do it. So it's a less restrictive way of addressing the problem. So the search factor it's another interesting question. And the original idea in the search factor is how much we're going to allow the short-term medium to grow with respect to the long-term medium. And this is a critical element in things such as black marble attacks. Why do we need it? Well, if we research the Visa network, what we'll find is that they have to have a search capability of 20 times approximately their average transaction per second. So I said about 6,700, multiply that by 20, you're 134,000 in that kind of range. And the reason you need this is because there's very few day, days in the year, in the Christmas holiday season, when everybody decides to buy gifts just in the last minute before Christmas. So a few other searches from other holidays. And so they gotta make sure that they can clear these transactions, so they need this factor. In Monero, we, it used to be 50, and one of the plans is to reduce this down to what is actually needed, uh, which is got closer to 16. Um, there's that doubling of the, of the final uh, block size that gives you actually 32. So this is reducing this down. We lower the maximum uh, grow, uh, growth in MS, uh, over five cycles. But the more important element is you really make it a lot harder to launch a black marble attack because now you're capping it at this point. And if this number is greater than your ring size, well, the black marble attack starts, the illusion starts to go away. So this is the basic changes to protocol um, proposed. And the main issue is the introduction of the long-term median yeah, sorry, the sanity or ultra long term median. The second uh, item is the, the tweaking of the um, uh, short term median by l lowering the search factor to really what is needed from the visa history to 16. So, lowering that down. Uh, we're increasing the growth of the long term mean slightly to account for the fact that we're dropping this down uh, from 1.7 to 2. 
And we're introducing the sanity medium that gives us the tool to be able to add a cost to increasing the block size without going to have to go back to protocol. It gives us a much stronger flexibility than we had before. Okay. So now we're going to do a little review on the fee markets. Fee markets in Monero are really interesting because they kind of like straddle the Bitcoin block size fight in Bitcoin. And if actually to find a, a median between the two, there's three, there's three fee markets. It's, the fee market basically is the interaction between the rational minus and rational users. A rational minus seeks maximum returns, rational users seek to pay the lowest fee. And then given a finite transaction in the pool, the optimal set is a is actually the correct solution is a discrete optimization problem, but it's a very simple approximation, which I like to call the infinitesimal transaction approximation, which simplifies this issue, uh, as I will explain. But that's actually, a tricky, strictly speaking, it's a discrete optimization problem. And so what you want to do is you make an approximation the minor order is a transaction order of fee per by byte. The minor then adds transactions to the block, starting with the highest paying transaction first. The minor tests this transaction for profit against the penalty and or the minor cost. Now, minor cost, what I'm referring to is other additional things. For example, in certain circumstances, you could get a case where you have often blocks. And in fact, it's a paper by a fellow called uh, Peter Risson, who's one of the Bitcoin cash uh, I think he's a developer there, and it came out uh, where he would argue you can create an effective penalty out of the risk of orphan blocks. Uh, so that's kind of an add-on that you can add in there. Uh, and then the miner stops when either the miner runs out of transactions or the miner runs out of the block and by this reach. So you have two possibilities. You run out of transactions or you run out of space. In this case, uh, you run out of space in the block if the people are paying a lot of money. or you have to you run out of transactions that meet this criteria. So what you do is you order the transactions, you start mining the highest paying first, and once the penalty meets the transaction fee, which is the lowest transaction fee you can allow, as the penalty rises, the transaction fee falls, you get a sweet point and you stop there. And that determines, so the lowest paying transaction pays the highest penalty, and you're looking at the incremental penalty for mining that transaction. This works if the uh, size of the transaction is very much less than the size of the block. Uh, and then you're going to approximate it um, in this manner. Okay. So you have three possible fee markets. And, I, and the, case, the first case is where MB is a lot less than ML. ML, of course, is your penalty-free zone now in your MS. Uh, so the minimum P zone being set in, but ML becomes a penal the penalty-free zone. And what this is is <clears throat> essentially you have a Bitcoin, a large, a Bitcoin large block scenario. And what you have is in that case there's no penalty because you can just you're filling it up before you hit the penalty. So B and B T equals zero theoretically. Fees can be zero. This was the case of Bitcoin until about somewhere between 2014 and 2016 when they started having a problem with blocks filling up. And, so, and it's the current case with Bitcoin Cash. The key thing to understand here, this is the Bitcoin Monero plus large Bitcoin block case, is that the, the, the fee and reward is very low, lower than in Monero. And the only reason really Monero can support a, fee, a minimum fee and reward, we are not really, is because of the threat of a penalty should this condition occur. So this is kind of where we've been most of the time, except for cases when we've, we've gone over into the penalty. So most of the time we've been in case one, and our fee is basically set by this threat the, of the increase. The next case is case two, which is the what I call the pure Monero case. And in here, you're in the penalty. And this is a really important formula. You add a transaction of size t to a block at point B in penalty and define 
the triangular transaction penalty rate becomes then R beat plus VT. You square this, you take the difference of the beat squared, and you left these two terms. This is the transaction that you're adding, and this is the point in the penalty that you're adding it at. And then what, what it tells you is you better get a fee from the transaction equal to this to overcome the penalty. So this is a critical formula for a Monero fee market. Uh, this term is essentially what you have if, you, if your B is zero, which is the quadratic, it's very small, and then this is the, the term. If you fill up the block entirely, the ratio between these terms for 1% growth is actually 200, which means your, your highest fee at the top with B equal to one would be equal to the ratio of these two. So B is 0.1, we can figure out what we have here. So BT is 0.01, you can calculate, that's where you get 200. Because you're dividing basically one by uh, 0.01. And that's where you get this factor in the fees. So as you increase your fee in the penalty, it goes basically up to 200 times. Okay. There we go. That's what I played there. Okay. Then in the next case, we have a very interesting case, which we haven't seen yet. And I call this a Monero plus small rock Bitcoin case. And this happens once you max out um, MS equivalent MB actually is bigger than 16 ml. So you have a situation where you've maxed out MS, your short term median, but you're still left with that last scaling where you can still add a block twice the size of your median. Now, what's different about this area is that there's no more scaling because MS is capped by ML, which in turn could be capped by MA. And so what happens at this point is you have an increasing penalty, and then you get a Bitcoin, a small Bitcoin block type block. So you actually end up with a behavior similar to Bitcoin. Uh, and you're hitting the barrier. But instead of the way Bitcoin works, which is, can be thought of as slamming into a brick wall, what you have in Monero is something like this. You hit it, but you actually get a stiff spring. You get some resistance for one last doubling of the uh, block size. So you get, and this resistance is against this very steep penalty curve that goes from, by a factor of uh, 200, as you keep pushing harder and harder into the penalty, the fee keeps going up and up and up just to pay the penalty. And so you have, instead of hitting a brick wall like in Bitcoin, you have a stiff spring. So you can think of, you know, you go to a railway station, you see these big springs, a train, a train comes in, and it can actually hit these things and slow it down. That's kind of the idea rather than smashing into a brick wall, as in the case, the case of Bitcoin. Now, what's interesting is that the Bitcoin fee reward is higher than in Monero, um, which would kind of say, now the other interesting point here to notice is everything's dependent on, on, on this block reward, which has some really scary issues for Bitcoin because if we're capping, if our base goes to zero, all of these penalties and incentives go to zero, and you basically have a zero cost for attack. So that's something to keep in mind which when we look at these formulas. Okay. So now we're gonna talk about attacks. And these are the two favorite ones that have been discussed, Big Bang and Flood XML or Black Marble. Um, and I'm gonna cover them briefly here. So the first one is Big Bang. Big Bang basically is sort of a malicious attack for no reason kind of thing, let's attack Monero. Trouble with that is it's actually cheaper just to 51% Monero than it is to do a Big Bang, but it is an attack that can be done as an add-on to a 51% attack, um, and that was the question of Big Bang uh, attack. It hasn't happened, um, so if they already have 51% attack, then, the, then they do this, uh, this other attack. Um, 
The key thing about Big Bang is there's not a particular blockchain surveillance motive in the attack itself. It's not designed for any particular purpose. It's more like Adam Ellis. The more interesting one is what we call Flood XML, Black Marble. Now, in Flood XML, Black Marble, the adversary, what the adversary is trying to do is flood the, the Monero blockchain with enough outputs and control enough of them that they can somehow lower the ring signature. So if you control, let's say, 50% of the outputs, you can half your, your ring signature. And then you get back into the arguments of blockchain surveillance. Well, it's a probability game. We, we flip the odds, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, I don't mind saying something. I'm actually certified in blockchain surveillance to cipher trace. That might surprise people. And I took the training as part of what I was working with the, on the Sterling off case. So I'm actually, I did very well on the exam. I actually aced it, like 20 out of 20. It's kind of like uh, training a fox and building chick, uh, chicken coops or certifying them on how to build them. <laughs> it's kind of really interesting. But one of the things that I really found about it interesting is that the, 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 it's a very tempting thing to do. And a lot of the people that were there, many of we were law enforcement, actually, what they were really interested in was um, how do you do Monero? Uh, that was uh, that was the big thing, and it was well, it's a probability, and it's not really part of this training, and blah blah, because it was a Bitcoin thing. But um, this idea, so the, in, the 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 temptation is with this stuff. There is a temptation. We can lower the ring size, and then maybe we can make the sale that we can do it in Monero, and that we can do some kind of whatever, which in fact doesn't really work. But okay. You know, we can do this. So the really only powerful remedy for this is for shame membership proofs. Um, that just totally wipes out the illusion. But you can actually do something interesting, and that is <clears throat> what you do is you can say, OK, well, if I have only a search factor of 16, and I have a ring size of 60, well, guess what? I can only search my black marble attack, say, 16 times, but I'm up against this massive ring size. That's a mitigation. So if you make your ring size significantly larger than your search factor, um, you can actually take the illusion away. I know a lot of work has been done. Uh, Rockneum actually did a lot of work on this issue of what is the optimal price for a certain budget and et cetera, et cetera, and concluded on this type of a number was, was actually optimal without factoring in this in. But if you, if you change the search factor and then you put in Ruckneum's analysis, um, it's kind of interesting because now you're saying, well, all I can raise it is 16 fold and I'm up against a ring size of 60. Well, I'm still going to be left with some uh, issue. Pricing, of course, is a mitigation. Increase the ring size. The other one is pricing, and, and it's important to realize that tight pricing is very important. Zcash was attacked for six months in 2023, and the reason they were attacked was pricing. If you look at the black marble attacks that we've seen in Monero, they're kind of very little. They kind of give up. Maybe they try something. Um, but you get the feeling in many respects that the attacker can be frustrated and simply worn down fighting uh, all the medians and, and, and uh, uh, etc. So that's a, a sort of the idea here. Okay, I made of this guy. That's where it is. Now one thing to always bear in mind with these type of attacks is that we are, everything is based on this tail emission. And if you leave, do not have, if this goes to zero, the whole thing collapses. The whole security anti-spam model collapses in Monero. This is something really important for Bitcoiners to realize. I'm sorry to tell you, but I think you have a problem with this business of falling block rewards. Because this is the root cause, this falling of, in my opinion, 
root cause of the block size debates in Bitcoin. Monero solved it. Monero solved it by a simple way. We simply have a tail emission, which is roughly equivalent to stopping the halving in Bitcoin at uh, where we are right now. But that's something to consider when we're dealing with this. Uh, this is what's essentially protecting Monero from a lot of this stuff. Okay. Fees in the use of um, no Monero non consensus flexibility. Now, again, the idea here is to uh, oppose fee changes. So a couple of things we can do. Um, because it's so close with a, with a larger ring size, um, we're going to go over 4,000 bytes fairly easily. So we move up to a 2% reference transaction instead of 8,000 bytes. Um, the, from what I can tell, the uh, Monero uh, flow chain membership groups are going to be very close to here. You stand there. So we, could, we return to normal scaling. So essentially, we're, forced, we're increasing all the fees by four times. There seems to be a fair amount of consensus in this direction to do this. And we can add down the road, if we wanted to, after full chain membership pools, we could agonize a fee level uh, that allows for 1% in. So increasing it will do that. The other thing we can do, and these, uh, you know, we can increase it also further if these conditions are met, essentially providing a way of, um, you know, if we have a really sized growth, m moderating the growth of the blockchain at these other points, that's an option that we have. Okay. Uh, and with requirements. What are we looking at? Well, it's quite interesting. No scaling. And uh, when I say 2.5 factor, I'm assuming we're moving blocks and transactions. Each transaction gets moved up roughly two and a half times. This could be lowered. We're going to be, you know, are we broadcasting the transaction and then broadcasting the block of the transaction and this kind of stuff. Uh, and then with no scaling, kind of where we are below, you're actually at basically a little faster than a dial-up modem. We're about 67, about twice the speed of a, a dial-up modem. Uh, ISDN speeds, basically. If you know what an ISDN line is from about uh, 25 years ago. Uh, you surge at uh, 1.5 megabytes. This is the maximum the, I call the hot spring, which is 2.2 megabytes. And again, you're looking at one transaction a second, 16 transactions a second, about 32. Then you go to this 256 level, kind of like PayPal, 256. Now, keep in mind, you always have to look at the, the, this is the, the, the average. This is equivalent to Visa 6700. This is the surge. So you surge it 16 times. Again, I think in practice, I don't think we're going to see the hot spring go all the way. It's just too expensive. It's probably going to stop around 20 or something like that, maybe 25. So that's something to keep in mind. We can do something about this here. But we're in the uh, things like uh, 546 megabytes uh, at 256. Here we're going. A thousand times, so this is about a thousand transactions a second on chain at the beginning. And again, we're dealing with uh, 1.1 gigabits. This is well within. Even this is here, the Monero, the Nodo, for example. It's fine with 2.2 gigabits. And it's got a massive um, graphics processor in there that can be used to uh, uh, do parallel processing. A key element in this is going to be parallel processing. This will go into to, to the high end, um, again, within the range you they get in the data center. And yes, there are internet connections to residential and small business that are gold is high right now, um, uh, um, the, the high end. And you're kind of approaching visa levels. Um, I think in a realistic sense, Monero could comfortably uh, handle visa transaction rates in a decade. Uh, we'll allow for scaling of the blockchain and we'll allow for growth in Nielsen's law, which is highly relevant. So this is kind of where we're going. Um, some considerations. Uh, they don't. Uh, this is, by the way, for unpruned nodes, so we're not pruning the nodes. The other thing to bear in mind is this surge is only uh, for a very short period of time, and like a couple of days or so. So for example, if one could think of the idea of maybe running a node in a, in a standard node 
for like 51 weeks of the year for one week going to a prune node and then going back again once that search is over and sort of catching up. So you have those kind of options too to consider. Uh, this is an interesting figure. Uh, for people that know what DOSIS is, it's the uh, data of uh, cable internet services. Uh, this is basically a uh, the cable modems. They tend to max out at 10 gigabits in one direction, 60 gigabit in the future. One of the major changes that we have seen is that the cable companies, and I saw, have gone from essentially up till about a year ago, you would see the cable company take part of their bandwidth and use it for traditional cable television and the rest for internet services. And what they've done is they've taken out that traditional television and say, okay, if you want cable television, we'll provide it to you over the regular internet, and now you have to subscribe uh, an internet service, and then they provide cable television over that. So now the entire bandwidth is used for the internet, and then they just deliver the cable television over your internet connection. And what that does is it frees up the whole thing and allows this. And with DOSIS 3.1, you can go down to about something like 10 gigabits in one direction and two gigabits up. So they have really are moving towards dealing with this. Again, you want uh, elimination or reduction transaction and transaction data. This is important. Uh, parallel processing is very important. Surge is the exception, not the norm in financial transaction networks. Again, we're dealing on this situation. You have to deal for a small time of the year. Most of the time, we don't. So for example, we can do new no synchronization outside of that window. Uh, and so you can control it that way. A key element is we must maintain flexibility, which is one of the big advantages of dealing with a, um, in Monero, with dealing with node relay over consensus. We need to be able to respond. Uh, what happens if with a sudden, you know, a couple of legal cases throw out blockchain surveillance and suddenly everybody wants to jump into the Monero blockchain, which has been quietly growing and improving, and we're dealing with these kind of things. Uh, so this is kind of the considerations that we have to do and some of the questions that we have. And uh, I'm going to move on for... Uh, Questions and discussion.